I think the best way to um, create a project is to um, is to position it as as if you're a consultant and you're solving a problem for somebody else. And that's how we positioned our project. Today, I had the pleasure of interviewing Christian Bordeaux. Christian is a senior business intelligence engineer at PlayStation. He's also previously worked in BI at Nike, Warner Brothers, USC, and Machinima. Christian has taken the tech world by storm when he first joined Clubhouse. He's now grown to over 23,000 followers. He runs rooms around data science and analytics and how to get your first job in tech. He's also helped thousands of people through Clubhouse with their LinkedIn's, their data projects, networking, salary negotiations, etc. In this video, we talk about how Christian made the transition from being a photographer to a data analyst. We also highlight his bootcamp experience and how he was able to create a massive demand for his skills and himself in the job hiring process. Finally, we touch on how he's been able to leverage Clubhouse to multiple new opportunities. I hope you enjoyed the episode. Christian, thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. We initially met uh, over some some voice apps and and talking around in Clubhouse. And it's really cool to be able to to hear about your experience there, hear about your experience transferring into to data analytics, and just tell your story here. Again, thank you for joining me. Absolutely. So um, yeah, data science and data analytics. Um, so on Clubhouse, I run the data science and analytics club. But you know, where did it all start? Um, in 2019, I I was a professional photographer. I shot weddings, I shot concerts, I shot um, headshots, I did everything and, and above, right? Um, and I came from the space of like, all right, cool, I need to shoot this headshot. I had to look at different types of photos that really worked. And then I had Instagram where I had, you know, likes, I had comments. And after a while, I was like, all right, I know how to shoot these shots. I know the technical background, shutter speeds, ISOs, um, and all of these things. And then I was just thinking like, okay, cool. I know how to do that. What's the next step, right? It's, I want to be able to provide photos that are giving as much value to my end users or my customers. And so I started, I did this with my concert photography. I looked at which shots, like, one, I would shoot like hundreds of photos and send them over to DJs. And then they would always post the same type of ones, which was usually a fisheye right behind them on stage where they can see themselves and as well as everybody else that's in the, the rave or in the concert. And so with that, I was like, okay, cool. This shot, you know, after just intuitively thinking like this shot is very popular, I need to make sure I always get this shot. And then I started thinking about, well, what shots do people want? So then I started doing my whole analysis and saying like, hey, these shots work really well for them and they work really well on my Instagram. Then I was able to create this whole analysis saying, hey, these are the key shot lists that I need to have whenever I do a concert. And so I started analyzing those numbers and I was like, dang, this is really cool. Um, <laughs> and I was thinking like, man, this is really valuable information. Like I would pay somebody else to do this because I noticed other photographers every time they would submit their photos, because I had to look at some of them sometimes, I'm like, why did you do this? Nobody wants this shot. Um, and for me, I was like, I have data in the background. So I took that and I was like, is this a job? <laughs> is this something I can do all the time? And so um, I was really keen on Excel beforehand. And I, I, you know, I was able to make pivot tables, but I didn't really know too much besides that. So um, I got a little bit more background is I got my degree in marketing. So when I when I came out of school, I was like, cool, I have to market myself as my photography brand, and so forth. So um, when I was doing that, I was it's it constantly about trying to find new followers, get create engaging content, and so forth. And so when I started analyzing these numbers, I was like, okay, what's the next step here? And I discovered I looked up the word data analyst, and it was a job. And I was like, holy crap, I want to do this. Um, I started doing some online searching. I looked up Udacity, Udemy, LinkedIn Learning. I actually started on LinkedIn Learning. And there was this video saying, hey, data science is the sexiest job of the 21st century from this Harvard. I'm pretty sure everybody's heard that one. And I'm like, I like that. 
<laughs> so um, I started I started learning on my own. I couldn't get down onto Python because like I tried downloading it and you know with Python they have Anaconda and all this stuff. It just confused me. I never got into it because of that and um, I continued on with photography. So then in 2019, um, I was working at Warner Brothers in marketing. And um, I was thinking to myself, like, dang, I'm surrounded by these data scientists, data engineers, and they're making fun of me because <laughs> I'm doing this manual labor in Excel. And, you know, they're making uh, frank fun. And I was just like, OK, what do I need to do? They're like, hey, you need to learn Python. You need to learn APIs. You need to learn SQL. You need to learn <laughs> all this stuff, Tableau. And I was just like, OK, you know what? I'm going to do that. So I started learning on my own. And then in 2019, in around, um, it's 2018, 2019, I got laid off from Warner Brothers because they got acquired by AT&T. I took this as a like, okay, cool. Like I could take this time to really start diving deep into data science. And this is where I continue my photography. Like I was always doing photography, working in marketing. And I was like, you know, I'm going to join a data boot camp. So in May of 2019, I entered the USC data science and visualization boot camp where I learned how to do everything that I've ever wanted to do. Um, so right out of the gate, like I saw that like they had Python there, they had APIs, they had data visualization in Tableau and in Power BI and um, Google Data Studio. I was like, holy crap, this is how I'm going to break out. And so as I got in, I wrote, I mean, this is where I'm going to kind of like talk about like how I made it now. So like, as I got in, I wrote a resume that had said that I knew all these skills already. I faked it till I made it. I was like, hey, I'm going to be in the school. This is what I'm going to learn. And I, I designed my resume to fit that 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 uh, that mold for a data scientist or data analyst. Um, and as I started learning new tools, I'm like, OK, every one of my homework assignments, my first Python homework assignment where I actually analyzed video game data. Oh, my God, I decked it out. I was like, you know, what, this homework assignment. I'm going to pitch it as if I am a, a consultant. And so I'm like, hey, this gaming company came to me. And they want to know how their uh, skins are doing, skins are like all of their DLC, what's selling, what's not. And that was when I knew like, yep, this is what I want to do. So after writing my first line of code, setting up my GitHub, putting out my first homework assignment that I pitched as a project, I knew I was onto something. So. Uh, six months goes by. That's the duration of the course. Um, I took that resume and I was applying to jobs constantly during that that um, that boot camp. And throughout that boot camp, it was honestly the craziest time. Like, <laughs> like I landed I landed a job three weeks into the boot camp, and I stayed at that job for a whole month. And I was still interviewing elsewhere. So I stayed. I went to this job. Then I got a I got a I got a dream job offer. Um, at Live Nation at, to work as a data analyst. And I was so stoked. It was going to pay me a whole lot more than I was making at that first job. So I had to quit that first job. And I was like, oh my gosh, I, I was there for a month and I really loved it. It was near my house and everything. And um, going to Live Nation was like, going to be like a two hour drive every day. It was going to be a trek, but I knew it'd be worth it because it's like my dream. So um, it was the Wednesday before the Monday that I was going to start at Live Nation. And I get hit up for this recruiter saying, hey, I have this job and it looks like it's five minutes from your house. I was like, no way. I looked at the map. I was like, why did you send me the map of my house? He's like, no, this place is right here. I'm like, oh my God, I can walk to this place. I go in for the interview thinking that like, eh, I'm not going to, I'm not going to do anything um, there. And I, I was just kind of nonchalant the whole time. I was like, I'm already sitting on an offer. I'm going to start Monday. Um, but here's my information. And I went on my way Thursday. Um, I get a call back from the recruiter says, Hey, they're really interested in it. Like what kind of price range would you want? I was like, well, I'm getting this much. And I just, I mean, I told him a number that was a lot higher than I was expecting. Cause I honestly didn't want the job. And he was like, Oh, that's it. We could do better. I was just like, Oh, um, <laughs> and on Friday night at 5 30 PM, I get an offer from, this company and i was just like oh my god this is thirty thousand more a year than live nation is offering me and i decide right then and there that I, I told live nation i was like you know what i'm i'm not won't be able to make it um and i started this new job at hydrofacial <laughs> and that was that was a really big deal for me 
Um, so, and granted, I'm st- this is m- I'm in month like one at, in in this boot camp, and so I'm still like month one, month two. I'm literally just finished Excel and starting Python, and I'm I'm still like interviewing around. I'm like, holy crap! I'm at this company. I just leave my LinkedIn up and running because recruiters will just keep hitting me up, and so. I'm going through this company. It's, it's super fine the first two weeks. And then some people just start leaving. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I don't have the support system that I had before. So I was like, this is interesting. I start feeling really scared because like there's just stuff I just didn't know. Like I'm an entry level worker and now I'm expected to do like senior level stuff. And I'm just like, dang, like I don't know how to do this stuff. And it got really uncomfortable for me that I just like, you know, I had to leave. Um, so I continued interviewing. Um, and I landed probably another 16 interviews across AT&T, Red Bull, NBC, all these really big companies. Um, and I found like after three months of that job, it was just stressing me out because I was one, I was working, but also two, I was doing that, that class that was really demanding homework assignments were going and going. And so after that, I was there for three months. So I'm coming up on my fourth or fifth month at the boot camp, And um, I leave that job. And now I'm just like, okay, cool. I'm going to go back to the basics and let's start applying to jobs again. I already, I already got hit up by many recruiters, landed a bunch of interviews. And the biggest breakout was um, I, so we are finishing up school and I had my final project. I was like, I know I have to do a business intelligence project. I have to do a data analytics project because I learned so much from hydrofacial and um and also the other companies that i was with for minor times and i was like cool everything that i learned there i'm going to put into this project find a data set that could curate the same stuff i was doing and um, i created in my class for my final project we created a group called BAC, b-a-c-c business analytics consulting uh crew or group or something like that um and you know when it comes to data we got your back (laughs) and so with that being said, um, created this project and I started adding this project to my applications um, and um, along with my resume that I already tailored beforehand and just like started putting these out there. And these were getting me way more interviews and continue to like bring back dividends. I end up landing an interview at, um, at Mattel. They make Barbies and Hot Wheels. Um, at, also at WaveMaker, which is a analytics um, they did, they did marketing for Paramount Pictures at the time. And I also landed an interview at Nike. And so after going through, I literally had Monday was Mattel, Wednesday was, um, Nike. And then Thursday was Wavemaker. Monday going to Mattel and they absolutely love me. They offered me on Wednesday. They gave me a a written offer on Wednesday. I was like, holy crap. I told them, hey, I'm still interviewing. Um, Can you let me, can I let you know by Friday or Monday? They're like, fine, but we need to let us know ASAP. So Tuesday, I'm prepping for Nike. I'm just like, holy crap. You know, this is like the number one brand in the world. Um, I have my project there, go into the interview, crush it. And, you know, they love my project. They just like, hey, can you walk me through this project? Like, tell me, tell me more, like how you solve this. And I did. And it was just really basic one-on-one stuff. People aren't, especially non-technical folks, they just like, hey, translate all of this crazy data into something that's easily readable for me. I like bar charts. I like pie charts. And, you know, make it easy for me. So I walked them through my data visualization project and showcased like, hey, this is the value we're able to derive from this data and how you can use it as a business user. Um, They loved it. I told them like, hey, I'm already sitting on an offer. Um, I told them that I need to get back to them on Friday. They're like, okay, cool. We're going to get an offer to you sent out ASAP. And so I was thinking like, oh my gosh, this is crazy. So then on Thursday, the next day, I go in for my interview at Wavemaker and essentially they gave me the job right on the spot. They're like, hey, here's a written offer. Here's a verbal offer. We're going to get in writing to you in five minutes, like as I'm leaving this place. And that Thursday and Friday, like that Thursday, I, I took a breath. I was like, thank you. Okay, I'll let you know by Friday. Friday comes along and I'm just getting phone calls straight back to back from all three of these people. Like, hey, we'll offer you this much. Hey, we'll offer you this much. Hey, this is what we're going to go. And I just remember it having them all battle over me. Sometimes I would literally just be on the phone and be like, oh, Nike's calling. Hang up. Talk to Nike. And then it's like, wait, Wavemaker's calling. Boop. 
and then just constantly going back and forth. And um, after the end of that, uh, that crazy Friday, um, I decided to go with Nike and I was able to negotiate a six figure sal- my first six figure salary and also a senior level position, which was nuts. And that project that I have is actually on my LinkedIn. So anybody can see that project. You know, I'm all about sharing the wealth in that respect because anybody can do this stuff. Also. Perfect. Perfect. Nice. Yes. Get the, put the link in the, the bio. Perfect. And so that's pretty much like how I got to data and like how a data bootcamp really shifted my, my, my way of thinking. Granted, not everybody in my data bootcamp was successful. I don't think it's a silver bullet, but for me, it was the reason why I liked a bootcamp was because one, this was before the pandemic. So I got to talk to everybody. I got to sit in a classroom again. And for me being, I graduated in 2016 out of Cal State Long Beach and going back into the school in 2019 was really refreshing because I knew I was going to be intentional with school versus being like, oh, I have to go and learn um, (laughs) human biology or chemistry, which I know I'm never going to use. And this was like a class where like I, I want to be here. So it was really cool to have this place of competition I like, you know, like competition where like, Hey, cool. There's other smart people in this, like in my class alone, we got, people got offered at Uber. People got offers at, um, monster energy, Disney, um, and all these other things. So like some really, really good people, all even cameo, um, out of these boot camps. So they definitely work, but it only works if you you're really intentional and make it through. So, so yeah, I mean, in a nutshell, that that's, that's where I am. And then uh, actually, so after I got into Nike, three months later, like I just leave the button open to work on. And next thing I know, PlayStation's like, yo, we want you. And I took the interview and they just made an offer. I couldn't refuse. And so then now I'm at PlayStation. So that's, and that's incredible, yeah. man. Congratulations. I, you know, I think there's going to be a lot of questions that, that arise from that initial conversation. So a couple of notes that I had that, that I thought were, were pretty relevant. I wanted to highlight and get more information on. So the one thing that I really loved, and it, it, I think is very similar for me is that you got interested in data analysis, data analytics, because you were interested in solving a problem or optimizing what you were doing. And at the time it was photography, but you know, for a lot of people, it's like, Hey, I want to understand this problem. And then they start doing the analytics and then they realize that they also like the analytics as a problem in and of itself and continue on. Uh, something, I mean, I I would say compared to pretty much well, most people that I've talked to, you've had a very, like a highly abnormal amount of success in the interview market, (laughs) which is, which is a good thing. And I think that that's something that we can learn from. So I'd love to get a bit more insight into those things. And, um, and a little bit more understanding about your process and what you were thinking. And so the first thing I wanted to understand was, you know, what type of roles were you applying to? You know, was, was it just that, hey, these recruiters are reaching out or it was, you know, I'm specifically looking for data analyst roles um, or, you know, like, oh, I'm just going to leave my door open to as much as possible and send out as many interview requests as possible. You know, what was that process like for you? What were you know, what were the channels you were using and how were you creating those relationships to get so many interviews? Oh my gosh. Yeah. This is a whole course on its own. So after I got laid off from Warner brothers, um, I decided to look into how does HR recruiting work? So I watched a bunch of videos talking about applicant tracking systems, how to get through it. Um, how applicant, it starts with the applicant tracking system. Then it goes to a recruiter. Then it goes to a hiring manager. And I just, I wanted to understand that whole process. So I watch a bunch of videos that probably recruiters watch. Um, and they said like, hey, this is what we have to look through on LinkedIn Recruiter. So I use primarily LinkedIn for most of these uh, job search uh, related things. I used Indeed for a while, but it was just so much easier just to stick on one platform. Um, so going forward, I knew that this is going, so if I think about everything as an ATS game, right? ATS is applicant tracking system, and it uses keywords in your resume in order to align to a job description. So once I realized that, it's like, oh, this is not what I thought it was, where just like say everything that you've done on your resume, and hopefully somebody will be able to derive the data that they need to understand in order to do the job. 
make it so much easier for them. You know, pretty much make it as efficient for them to read your resume and make it look like you're a superstar for that role. So that's the kind of mindset I put myself into. It's like, all right, how do I become a superstar? How do I showcase that I have Excel experience? How do I showcase that I've used Tableau or these tools that they're asking for? So first thing I did when I when I joined the boot camp, I was like, cool, these are all the tools that I'm gonna know. So I started categorizing them. Like I read a bunch of job descriptions and you know, I, I made a, a list of things I wanted to learn that I needed to learn. And um, this was before I even entered the boot camp. And so what I was doing was I had that list of keywords that I needed to learn, like SQL, databases, data warehousing, data pipelines. I had no idea what these were. Um, so like I would go on to LinkedIn learning and I got the certifications for it to say, hey, I watched all these videos. It gives me some level of credibility. And that was my initial start. And I was like, you know what? A boot camp would actually be probably the best type of thing, especially from a school that's really well known. Um, so I knew it's a word, it's a word game. So I created the, in my opinion, the optimal resume for a data analyst position. So I looked at data analysts, I look at marketing analysts, just cause I had a background in buying ads on Facebook, LinkedIn, and just all the social medias as well as Google. Um, so I had, I had bought those ads. Um, and I was like, how do I tell the data from this? Cause like when you're writing a resume, right? Like you have your experience section, you're like, Hey, I increased revenues by X percent at this company because I did X, Y, Z. And that was like, I, that was ingrained in me that I need to create these insights that, Hey, this is how I added value to a company. I was like, wait, like I'm doing this, I'm writing this resume. I'm really loving that. Like I took daily notes at every single one of my jobs and still to, to today I do that. And so then that way when I'm, when I leave a job, I'll know like, Hey, this is everything I did. These are different projects I worked on and this is how it impacted the whole organization. So um, with that being said, um, when I was applying to jobs, I made sure that my resume was wordsmithed, SEO optimized or ATS optimized SEO search engine optimization. And I made sure that when my resume went in, I got phone calls from recruiters. Um, and that's how I was able to track it. So if, I applied to, let's say, one job a day. I mean, that was kind of how I was doing it. Um, I would probably, like, I don't know, out of 100 of those places, I'd probably hear back from, like, 10. So maybe out of 10 places, I'd hear back from one. And so for me, that was that was a really good ratio compared to my friends that were looking for roles and stuff of that nature. So I started getting phone screens with lower-level companies, and, um, and I, I just started learning, like, hey, these are the types of questions that they start asking. Again, after I did 20 interviews, it was like I started to get an understanding of how the interview process worked and how those things happened. But I wanna talk about like how I even got those interviews. Um, I had an optimized resume. I never had a cover letter for tech jobs. I just wanna put that out there. And cause like, it's just too much for too much work for me. And then third, I had a project and I, I always had a PDF project. It was like a slide deck, like a Google slides. Um, and I always attach that to my applications because it's something that's um, added value because then it could provide color to your resume, especially if you call out a project in your project section, especially for newer people. And um, with that being said, like I had friends that were in my boot camp and they had no experience in data whatsoever. It was the first time they opened up Excel. Like that was, and what I, what I help with them is like they came from the, uh, service industry. So they worked at like hotels and I don't know what the industry is called, but hospitality. Um, hospitality. Yes. And so with their resume, the way I optimized it was we put this, you know, their name, their LinkedIn, everything on the top contact information. And then we had skills at the top. And then we talked about projects and like those projects are where we really filled in those keywords that were important and also had links to it. And as well, under projects, we put their experience and we just really highlighted the leadership and soft skills of those other roles, like managing other people, managing deadlines and stuff of that nature. And pretty much that was the way to go about it because the way that recruiters see a resume is like, you have to get them in the, that first half, which is this part, which is the top line. Like you need to make sure that that aligns with what is in the job description. So pretty much optimized resume, and a project. And that was what was able to get me a bunch of phone screens. And third and last thing, which is really big that people don't know about because it's not something that's 
said is there's talent agencies out there. So, I mean, I'm just going to shout out a couple of them. There's Vaco, there's Tech Systems, there's Verdi Systems, there's Harnum. Um, there's a lot of these companies that I could just, just riff off. And what their whole purpose in life is to get your resume into their database. And they're pretty much going to hit you up whenever they have a job opening. So, for example, um, Tech Systems hit me up for Nike. And pretty like pretty much I was in their database. They had given me like maybe a four or five different interviews where I didn't even have to apply. They just said, hey, Christian, would you be interested in this role? And they give me a job description. And I'm like, heck yeah. And the reason why it's a win-win is because when, let's say, you know, for me and Nike, so there's me, Nike, and then Tech Systems in the middle. When I got the offer to work at Nike, Tech Systems takes a cut from every one of my paychecks. And I don't see that cut. I get whatever I get offered, let's say I get X amount of per hour, I'm going to get that. And then on top of that X amount per hour, their tech systems is going to get money. So it's a win-win situation where um, tech systems finds you a job or any kind of talent recruiting agency, and then you'll be able to get that job afterwards. So those are the three things, optimize resume, um, a project and utilize, like once you get into one of these databases, you're in for life. Um, and there's just so many of them. And that's how I was able to constantly get phone calls, setting up, setting up um, different interviews. And this has worked for all my friends that have done this as well. And this is something that I really push really hard on Clubhouse because people just don't know about this, especially, um, you know, up and coming people or people that are, have been in a job for such a long time. They're so new to the job market. Even LinkedIn is new for them. So it's kind of, it's kind of a new paradigm of which um, to search for a job. And now if I ever needed to look for a new job, I know how to do it. Like I don't have to go through the whole pain phase. Like I know it needs to be done. I know the formula for success and just pushing that forward. So that was a good question. Yeah. Well, that's, that's awesome. And you know, something that I think you highlight more so than almost any other guests that I've had on the show is uh, how important focusing on the outcomes is, you know, what you had said to me is you basically designed what you thought the perfect data analyst resume was before you even started anything. And you went in and you filled the gaps for yourself. I think that that's like a really, at least to me, a novel concept of saying, where do I want to be? What do I have to do to get there? And can I create a very, very clear uh, lineage to, to trace to that? And a lot of people think of that in their career as a data scientist or a data analyst, they think of it in the long term, but they don't think about it in that intermediary step and very necessary step of getting a job. So I really, really like that. I recommend that everyone does their homework and does their research like you did. That's something I recommend and I think it gets lost in the noise, but treat this process, treat this interview process like you're a data analyst or a data scientist. You'd collect data if you're doing that, <laughs> right? You'd figure out what works. You'd go and do like you did. I've never heard of someone watching all the HR videos to be able to understand <laughs> the process more. But that's that. I mean, to me, that is really, really meaningful. I mean, it also should show, hopefully, to everyone listening that, you know, Christian didn't have all of this success because he was lucky or whatever it is. It's because he fundamentally looked at the process different than a lot of other people. And he did things differently than how they do it. You know, I mean, a one in 10 if you're sending out, I would imagine you probably sent out over a hundred, um, over a hundred, 200, uh, applications based on the, the numbers you gave me, um, of 20 interviews, whatever that is like, that's a lot of work. And, you know, you found a way to make it really successful. And it also shows, I talk a lot about, uh, not necessarily going through traditional doors, going through, uh, like talking directly to the hiring managers, whatever that might be but you can still have success in the, in the more traditional job applications if you understand the process and you optimize for it. And again, you're doing things that people are not looking for. Um, so I, again- Just one thing to, I was gonna say, one thing to add on that too, was when I started learning about applicant tracking systems, I learned, like I thought coming out of college, the most important thing was your resume looked really pretty. So that's easily to read. So a lot of my friends, they were going into Photoshop and creating like putting their photo on their thing and just adding all these graphics. And once I learned that ATS was 
like it doesn't read photos very well. And that, that way, like your resume just goes straight to the trash. It doesn't even, you know, the ATS just sifts you out, filters you out. And that to me was a game changer. Like, oh, so these boring looking resumes are what's actually getting read. Then like, hey, you know what? Like, I'm all for it then. You know, let's create it simple. Let's create it as easily read as possible. And when you optimize for those three different buckets, which is ATS, recruiter, and then um, the hiring manager, like an ATS knows nothing about you, but it knows the job description, right? Re the recruiter knows about the job description, but doesn't know really well exactly what this role is going to be doing because this recruiter is going to have a, a couple of jobs in rotation, but they know kind of what the, their relationship with the hiring manager. And the hiring manager doesn't know anything about AT or doesn't have to know anything about ATS or recruiting. They just know they need somebody for this job. So you have to optimize for those three different things. So I just wanted to put that out there. Like, do not do photo resumes. Um, they will get you put in the trash. Maybe if you direct email, but at that point, like, you're not going to be doing that very often. Well, I, I love, you know, that to me, that's really important is knowing the channel. So I used to have multiple resumes that I would have <clears throat> one for systems one for if it was like a cold email or LinkedIn and you know to me that's matching the message to the channel is really important right a recruiter might love the beautiful resume that you have and if you're sending that directly to them it might have a higher chance of going up the chain of command you know if you're sending something directly to a hiring manager if you send them their your project there or something that is going to show you their work, they might be really into that and not really care even that much about your resume or how well optimized it is. So to me, I just, I think the idea of really understanding the process, breaking it down, understanding who to reach out to, what message to send them, because you, you know, you apply and uh, you know, with a, that beautiful resume to even a big company versus a startup, some startups don't, if they're at early enough stage, they don't use application tracking systems, right? And they're going to be looking yeah. for someone who's not cut from the same cloth, who's doing things a little bit different. So you might have success with a more uh, artistic resume there. But at one of these large multinational corporations, I actually did an A-B test in an interview. I brought out two resumes. I was like, which one do you like best? And they're like, why would you ever show me this one with all the pictures in it? But <laughs> I, mean, I, I digress. I mean, understanding the, the, the personality of the companies or understanding again, what channel you're pursuing to me is fascinating. And so I have one question actually backtracking a little bit. And, you know, we, we've talked a lot about this bootcamp. I've been pretty clear that I think bootcamps can create value for certain people. I personally believe bootcamps are a lot more effective for helping you to land an analyst position than a data scientist position, unless you're coming from a PhD background. If you're coming from a PhD I think boot camps are an incredible resource to leverage into a data science role. But I wanted to understand more your process of saying, okay, first, how did you determine this specific boot camp? We like, like, what was the process of saying, okay, first, I need a boot camp. Second, how do I find one? Third, I found one. How do I leverage it effectively? Like that whole span to me, again, I have not done any boot camps personally. So, so getting that, that insight is very important for me and for everyone. Else. Absolutely. Right. I didn't just jump into a boot camp. I had done so many LinkedIn learning classes. I did a, I did like half a Udemy course. Um, and I just, I would like, and also Udacity courses, I would get stuck on one problem and then quit because I could never get past it. And the next problem was like, Hey, it builds on the last problem. So I got stuck, didn't have any kind of mentor to help me. And now that I look back at it, I'm like, Oh my God, that was such a simple, like, I just missed I just missed a, a freaking semicolon. And that was the reason why the code didn't work. And so, you know, that's that's what's frustrating. So I, I had all this frustrations going through online courses and I was just like, nobody can help me. The Slack channels, like I had to describe it so much by that, that point and then somebody had to respond to it. Um, and so for me, it was just not working in my brain. And, you know, I felt more frustrated than I was learning, um, but, you're absolutely right. You can learn this stuff all online. Things have gotten so much better. I mean, just in this two years alone with the pandemic coming out, so many online resources have opened up. So what? how did I decide which bootcamp to join? I looked at a bunch. I was looking at General Assembly. Um, at the time, it was Trilogy. Trilogy works with um, 
works with all the college systems. So it's kind of just like baked into a college. So Trilogy had a course with USC, UCI, and other like UC systems up and down the coast in California. And also I looked at uh, UC Berkeley. UC Berkeley had an extension type of thing and it was once a week and it was, I think it was like six weeks long or something. And it was really short. And so I, I kind of balanced it out. I, I literally did an analysis where I like, all right, how much does it cost per hour to be in this classroom? And um, <laughs> I found the highest value was the USC one. It was the cheapest to hourly, like, like the amount of hours in a classroom. And I was like, screw it. I'm gonna go for that. Put USC on my name just because people, people love that. And it's, I always felt that since I didn't go to a decent, like a high level school, I felt like, man, maybe I'm getting, um, I'm getting screened out because I went to Cal State Long Beach. Um, so I was like, you know what, let's get USC on my name and then just, you know, flaunt it out. And like now my whole identity, like even today, like everything is USC. <laughs> I say I went to USC just because when now when I go to work, when I started those jobs while I was in that USC course, people are like, oh yeah, Trojans, man, right, we should go to a football game. And it just, cr it just cr easily created network. And whenever I would also network really well with the UCLA people, for those that don't know, USC and UCLA, they're both um, UC level, UC systems, um, yeah. UC systems in the same city. So they're constantly fighting against each other. So there's a rivalry. And so whenever I see a UCLA person, I'm like, oh, you went to a, you went to a crappy school. And it would be always like, I would neg them, but they would always laugh it off. Like, ah, oh, yeah, I remember the rivalry and, you know, easily talk to them. And that's, that's all that those, these UC systems, like in my opinion, gave to me is that sense of social equity. Um, but the education is like the same. So, so I decided, created that analysis of like the cost per minute, <laughs> cost per hour. Um, and I decided, you know, what, I'm gonna go with USC. I mean, that's really a weird roundabout way, but also with USC, I was able to, uh, it was also the closest one. Um, the UC Berkeley one would have been completely remote. So um, I wanted to go somewhere and drive somewhere and be a part of people, like be, be with other people. I'm, I'm hardcore extroverted. That's why I think I do so well on Clubhouse. And that's, I think that's why I did really well in this course too, is because I thrive on community and um, being able to help other people, but also learn from a lot of, you know, learn from people in person. And I knew that if I, act, like, we had office hours before and after class, and I was going to those every single day, no matter what, because there was always some little problem that I had that I just like, it's like, why is my why is my Jupyter notebook not working? And they're like, oh, you didn't upgrade it to the latest version. I'm like, I would have never known how to do that. Um, and so, you know, that was that, that was something that like, for me, even downloading Anaconda, getting my GitHub set up, getting Git Bash set up on my Windows computer was was a pain. And that's why I really like boot camps because you have somebody there that knows how to do this stuff. And they're like, okay, cool. Here, let me jump in. Let me help you with this. This is how you diagnose this. This is how you debug it. And yeah. So that's pretty much uh, how I got into data boot camps and why I think they're good. Hey, well, I, I really like that story. I think it, it speaks to a couple really important things about your specific use case and how this could be relevant to other people is you diagnosed a problem within your own learning is that, hey, I'm running into these barriers. I think that a boot camp could help in a certain way. And it wasn't just one thing also. It was like, wow, well, for me, the boot camp is really important because I get access to an alumni network that I didn't have access to before. A very, very strong alumni network, right? I'm sure that was a huge consideration. The other is, okay, I know I learned really well from other people. I want to be able to, to get that type of help. I want to be able to leverage the office hours, talk to the professors, do whatever that is. And I mean, I, I think third, like a fortunate thing is like we can't afford these things. I don't think that um, I don't recommend anyone to go into debt for education. That's something I've done. I'm paying off a lot of student loans. I wouldn't say I necessarily regret it, but that's something that has to be like really, really carefully considered beforehand. But once you got there, it also seems like you had very clear intention about how you're going to use the program, how you're going to leverage it. And, you know, we talked about the resume and how you set that up before. So my advice to anyone who's considering a boot camp is one, it could very well be a good use case for you. 
but look really introspectively about how am I going to leverage this? How is this going to turn into further opportunities? Like you can't go in and be like, just because I do a boot camp, I'm going to get a job. That is absolutely, absolutely not how these things work. So it, it, it really is inspiring to see how well thought out this was for you. And, you know, a, a lot of the time you're like, you introspectively are like, oh, I didn't think that out that well, but you realize you thought it out a lot better than some other people did. Um, but, you know, I, I got to commend you on that front is that like, it, it was a good fit, a perfect use case for you. And you went out and you did it, you, you like did the homework and were able to do that. That's something that um, I think a lot of people are, are it, it's a little bit frustrating sometimes, but I find a lot of people who want to break into this field, they just don't do their homework. And they're like, oh, this is the, yeah. the answer is I take this course and I get a job. I do this boot camp and I get a job. And like, you can see from, from, from Christian here's story, I'm talking to the audience now, like how much work actually went in, even though he did the boot camp. So, I mean, to me, really, really powerful. Yeah. Pro tip on boot camp selection, always research who's going to be teaching the class. Um, this was one of the biggest negatives. I'm not endorsed by Trilogy, but they've had, and, and not just Trilogy, but, you know, they, there's been reviews, bad reviews across the board for data boot camps for the lack of transparency and like who teaches the class because there was this one situation where I had talked to my friend who was also part of this where one of the teachers he was a UX UI designer teaching a data science and analytics class and it was just like this guy pretty much checked out on all of the python stuff and that was like most of the class and I was just like dude that sucks but when it came to the web design portion he thrived obviously um but you know that's important when you're when you're in search of these people, like I had, I had like a high level VP of engineering and data science would do my class. I was like, all right, I'm solid. And he ended up being like one of the coolest teachers ever. And also the, the teacher's assistants as well. Um, they were, they were working at ADP. They were working at these really big tech startups. And I was just like, <laughs> say less. So it was an easy decision afterwards to like go into it. But I heard horror stories where people are, Teachers are just not qualified to teach it, but they're doing it for social equity. I mean, they don't get paid that much. Like it, you, they get paid in tech, they get paid a whole lot more than what they get paid you get, here. You get paid in class. Um, <laughs> yeah, you get paid to say that you are a teacher at USC or you are a paid teacher at General Assembly, which is something that's really valuable in the space. And that's kind of why for me, after I finished the course, they asked me to come back as a TA. I'm like, heck yeah, like let me get let me get some extra clout. But the thing is, why is it clout, right? Because it's not clout just because it is clout. It's because you are teaching somebody else how to code. And constantly in my jobs at Nike, PlayStation, like I'm constantly having to teach somebody how to do something. And it's how to be patient, um, how to walk things one by one. And also like, you know, I don't know, I'll just say again, patience, because, you know, sometimes they might not get it the first, second, and even third time. Um, and you know, that's really important to have that level of communication as you're teaching teams and stuff of that nature. So, you know, if you do go through a boot camp and they ask you to be a TA, that'd be a really good way to get about it too. Because also as to the network, like when I was a TA, um, in person, it was just fun to hang out with everybody, first of all. And then two, like when I had a problem at work, I was like, gosh, God, I don't know how to solve this. And they're like, oh my God, it's just this. And I was just like, Phew. you know, the teacher will be like, here, let me help you out. It's just this you know this is a very common issue here's how to do it and i'm just like boom it's just a, another way to continue one learning because when you teach python new things clicked in my brain i'm like oh that's how this algorithm works oh okay yeah like i just have automatically import P, you know pandas as pd um now is embedded into my brain and how to you know just do all these things that didn't click the first time around so um yeah pro tip to summarize uh, research your teachers and uh, don't be afraid to become a TA. I think that's a really valuable thing. I mean, you're not going to get paid much at all, but it's really about just putting that experience on the board. Because I in my interviews, that's what one thing that I really talked about. It's like, wow, you worked at USC as a teacher. I'm like, heck yeah, I did. Um, and I talked about that experience. So, awesome. well, I think yeah. that, that that clout clarification is really important. Is that it's <laughs> not just for the present? It's it's for hey, this is the story we can tell around this, and I really like that. Something I, else I wanted to, to touch on that I highly recommend everyone in these spaces do when they're pursuing either a master's degree, a boot camp, a certificate, any of these things is 
find people on LinkedIn, ask them their, what their experience in the program was. You know, that that's something that I, I you know, we, you talked about like doing your homework on the, on the teachers, but who's going to give you the most honest perspective, right? As a student, <laughs> either you, you get a mixed bag, you say, hey, this person has a job I want. I want to see how they leveraged it. If you have that conversation, they could tell you exactly what to do during that process to have the same success they did. If you go in and, and find someone that, you know, maybe they didn't, do that great out of the program, they can tell you maybe what the pitfalls of the program were. And you can say, okay, is that something I could personally overcome? Or is that something that would be a negative on the program itself? I mean, people ask me to review programs, certificates, courses, all this stuff all the time. I don't have enough time to go through and take all these programs. How am I going to give a good perspective on it if I haven't taken it? So to me, it's like, find someone who has taken it, even if they're not an expert, uh, not that I'm an expert data scientist, but even if they're not a, a super experienced data scientist, they've gone through that whole program. They have more, they know more about that whole program than any data scientist out there. They could be the smartest person there, who, but they haven't taken that program, right? You're not asking for data science knowledge. You're asking for program specific knowledge. So I, I cannot stress that enough, um, just like the, the importance there. Oh, I can tell you all the cons to data boot camps. I mean, I think it's, you know, I'd said all those good things about it, but there's a lot of cons and I can definitely get into that. Like pretty much one, it's super time consuming. Like they say 15 to 20 hours a week, like including the time that you're in class. Hell no. It's a whole, like, it was so hard for me to balance a full-time job and do the course. Um, I would recommend it. Like if you're going to take this six week course or sorry, it's 24. The one I took was 24 weeks and it was six months. Um, like just be prepared at work to be like completely slammed. Um, when I was first doing it the first month, I was, I was just doing the course full time and, you know, just applying to jobs as the other piece of my time. So I had a lot of time to do homework, you know, did things with ease, but when it came down to crunch time, I had to really optimize my time. Um, so that, that's one thing. It's extremely time consuming. I would say it's closer to 30 hours a week, to be completely honest. Like that's like, you know, it's close to five hours a, full -time a day. Job. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Like I didn't sleep for six months. Um, so there's that. Um, the other negative side is, again, the homework is crucial. Like if you don't pass, okay, some people with boot camps, um, they get it help, they get paid, how do you say it? their current employer will pay a certain amount of it. Um, so you have to pass the class in order to get that money. So if you're, if you're currently working and you're gonna get employers to help with the education piece of it, um, getting that A is, is really difficult because these homework assignments are ev like, at the one I was part of, they are every week. And so just be wary of the time commitment. Uh, another thing too is cons is that, you know, they teach you how to do the data stuff, but it's up to you to really own up on the career side. And especially in my boot camp, the career development was not very prevalent. Even though, like, you could schedule a time with a career coach, it wasn't embedded into the um, to the curriculum. So you're kind of left to job search on your own if you don't go out of your way to like study this. So. I found that as a big negative. I think it should be like, they should just add another week where it's like, okay, cool. Now you've done all this crap. This is what you should do. Like a resume class, a LinkedIn class, um, and just prepare yourself for that. Cause they give you the thing in the beginning, like, Hey, this is how to write a resume. And they're hoping that you read this stuff. Um, but I think career development could be a whole lot better. So again, when you go into this boot camp and you graduate, like just having a certificate is not going to get you a job. I'm going to tell you that straight up. What will get you interviews is like, hey, showcase the value that you got out of that, like through your projects, through the understanding. And I need to see that you could critically think and communicate data to non-technical data folk. Um, I think the one, I'm going to say the biggest win actually is at the end of my USC course, we had a... Um, we had a night where we pitched our projects to employers and stuff of that nature. And that was really fun. I had already landed my job at Nike. So I wasn't really too like, I didn't care. But when I did that, I got like three offers at that, at that fair. And I was just like, you know, I kind of just told them like, yeah, I'm already sitting on an offer at this much. And they're like, Oh, okay. never mind. We're looking for a junior level person, but um, my friends got jobs, but yeah, that's the biggest negative uh, well, to boot camps. You know, I think that that's really important. And it's also uh, important to note that, like, I, I think one of the 
challenges with any of these things, certificates, boot camps, uh, master's degrees, is they vary so much by individual program too. And it's it's yeah. hard for us to to group them all into one thing. I mean, I'm sure there's probably a couple boot camps out there that like again, I have not done my homework on this, but that I would say like, wow, they they do exactly what you need to do to get a job. They give you the correct support here, the correct whatever this is here, whatever this is here. But like yeah, no one's gonna evaluate it based on just what it is. They're gonna evaluate it based on what other boot camps have said and the misinformation and whatever that is. So, you know my best advice is always to just do your homework on the specific programs you're looking at. Right. Uh, you know, we, we talked about looking at the professors, looking at the outcomes, looking at the data they have, looking at the curriculum. Like those are the things that are going to be able to tell you if this is a good fit for you. Um, it's a spectrum. I think because you don't want to be so far, you do so much research where you don't make an action step where you're like, sure. okay, cool. I mean, Granted, for me, I spent probably weeks and months like debating it, and I constantly had this fight with my parents at the time because I was like, I like I had saved up all my money from Warner Brothers, and that, pretty much all the money I'd saved, I put it towards this boot camp, and I asked for you know a loan from my parents as well. I think it cost me like eleven thousand dollars, and I had like ten thousand dollars saved, so I I put that towards the boot camp. And, um, you know, they're like, oh, it's not worth it. You know, just going to school, you can literally learn this stuff online. But I told them, like, I can't. Like, I tried the online stuff, the free online stuff. And, you know, I would say try that first, you know, because I learned so much from free online resources. Always do the free stuff first. Like, even when I go talk to, on, at conferences and stuff, I'm like, make sure that you want to go down this route before you spend $10,000. And that's one thing that I think is another mistake is that people didn't do that research and they came into the course. And like, we started the course with 50 people, ended with 20 people graduating. I mean, like half the course like dropped off, which is rightfully so. Some of them were not made for that place. They're like, how do I turn my computer on? I'm like, no, nope, you're gone. Like, you know, it's just like, <laughs> it, it, it just yeah. wasn't, it wasn't for them. It's interesting to me. So, you know, I went back and I did my master's in computer science and I, I hadn't ever like <clears throat> taken a formal computer programming class. Right. Um, I found a program that would teach you the basics and, and the intro and get you all the way from beginning computer science into the, into through the master's program. But when I came the first day of class, I knew how to code, right? Like I had done Code Academy. I'd I'd worked and I've gotten this base level. So I felt like I was prepared. Like, I think that's a prerequisite for any of these things is like, do as, like, come come prepared for the first day. Don't, don't let it be just this completely a blank slate. That's not how you get ahead. That's not how you're going to have success in these things when they are going to be yeah. difficult. Um, so, you know, I, I completely echo what you're saying. And I love that bias towards action as well. I mean, I think you're right. It is very easy to get. And th this is some advice I almost always give with online courses specifically is that like, they're all pretty good. Just choose one and go. I think the challenge that I have with giving that exact same advice to the boot camps is just the, how much more expensive they are. And so it does justify just a little bit you know, significantly more, but you still have to make that leap at some point. Absolutely. So uh, one thing I want to, I have a couple of more things I want to touch on. The first is a little bit about projects. So, you know, you, you'd address that how important projects were for you in your process. I'd like to hear more about your philosophy on that or, or what someone can do to make an effective project that people will look at and open their eyes at and, and might prompt them to want to bring you in for an interview. Absolutely. I think projects is one of the biggest things I always push even if you're not in data science, if you have a project, like let's say you're a project manager. Or something, so you're a photographer you have, in your portfolio, right? Like, <laughs> exactly, right? You know, you need to showcase your skills at some point, right? Because you could write all these amazing words, you know, SQL, you know, Python, you know, this stuff. But I want to know, how did you use that tool to build something? Python is just a tool. You know, like I have a knife in my kitchen. Does it make me a cook, a chef? No. You know, like, could make so order if I can, if you... <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Right. Um, so knowing the tools are not enough. I knew that going in because from photography, like I knew that like these, I don't know. I learned a lot from photography. I learned how to become an entrepreneur. I learned how to sell myself because nobody else is going to sell me until I sell me. Um, so going into this, going into this whole data science thing, I noticed that tech people are not the best at marketing themselves. And that was just from like 
asking my, you know, the VP, like my teacher, I was like, why does your LinkedIn look like this? And it's because he's at a point where he has so much social proof that he's worked out these biggest companies that he doesn't really have to work very hard. So when he's giving advice, it was kind of tough because when somebody doesn't have this, this kind of things, like they need to lean on different measures or different um, things. And that's projects, projects, especially if you have no background. Again, I came from marketing and um, photography primarily. Um, you know, I legit had to pull out my ass, like, um, like how I use data to help me with my photography. And, um, and I did that on my LinkedIn. And I, I made sure to put that there to say, hey, I analyze photos to better my business by this. So I think the best way to um, create a project is to, um, is to position it as, as if you're a consultant and you're solving a problem for somebody else. And that's how we positioned our project, our uh, business analytics consulting group. And um, we just said, hey, these are the questions that the businesses had. We collected business requirements and this is what they wanna know. Here's the data that they have. So therefore, how can we answer these questions and solve it? And so in this project, I go over, like this is the project that landed me Nike, I go over, what the data pipeline is currently and how we're going to make it better. And so everybody's working in Excel and making all these Excel changes. And there's no, um, pretty much anything could happen in Excel. Some, some one person could mess up something and it, fix, it breaks everything else down the line. Or you could create, you know, a system on AWS, um, pull in all this data in real time and or as close to real time as possible and then create this infrastructure that can create these automated reports that will save the company time but also be able to dive even deeper into the data without having to think about yeah, is this data correct is this right because you have a whole team to to help with that so we pitched we pitched that and then also we talked about like hey you know this data is in spreadsheets but how do we effectively communicate like this is what the business should do next and that's that's the biggest thing because when when you're in acad academia and you're like, cool, I created this line chart. Um, give me a, give me a participation award. Heck no. Like that was one thing as I was a TA in the next course, I was like, that line chart says nothing. Like I need you to tell me what should I be doing with this data? What is the question? How do you effectively do storytelling? And um, that's why for me, again, I kind of didn't talk about it much, but I love to read. And so like, like for me, I have, I have these five books that um, I write a lot. So let me see, I could do this. There we go. Oh, I like it. I haven't read any of those. So I'll probably have to, to pick a couple up. Yeah, it's cool because on Clubhouse, I actually got to interview some of these authors, which is Sick. super awesome. Yeah, um, like this, this, this one I got to interview. This is um, uh, Cole, Cole Nathlick. Uh, she, she wrote about storytelling with data. And I got to interview her on Clubhouse, and it was it was super cool. Um, wild, but that was one extremely wild. It, it blew my brain. I was like, oh my god, I got her, and you know, I got her talking about it. Um, but you know, one of the things that's really important there is like, you know, it's not enough to create these graphs. It's not enough to say that you wrote the code. You have to tell me a story with the code. Like, why should I give a? Why should I care? What's in it for me? And that's that's the most important thing with projects. Is like, always be end user focused like how am i helping and adding value to somebody else it's not enough that you wrote this really cool machine learning algorithm and you know you say like, oh this is how i determine which machine learning alg algorithm to use what i really want to know more about is like how can somebody like for example we had this one this one project where they're using machine learning to determine um how to optimize betting in dog races and I was like, yo, this is legit. But then when they, their whole project was talking about how they trying to come up with machine learning models, I'm like, no. Which money did it make the company? Come on, guys. Exactly. Like, ex like, what is the potential here? Like, you need to pitch it to me. And so, you know, I, I went through their whole pitch. I was like, all right, this is how we're going to do it. You know, you're going to say with this algorithm, you can beat, you could beat the house. And, you know, that way you can create this algorithm that will bet for you at the last possible second, the highest probable winner based off past data, which they had access to um, because somebody worked in the betting industry. And they're like, if you can hedge your bets and let's say you get millions of dollars in on this 
and you could win, you know, more than you times you lose, like, and you can outbeat the stock market, boom, that is a big value there. And especially if you get a bunch of people into it, like that's how you got to pitch it. And then you say, Hey, we use machine learning and this is how we did it. Right. You got to, you got to hit them with the headline and then, and then tell them how you did it if they care enough to continue on. But if you hit them with, well, open up my Jupyter notebook and the P values were this like, Oh, they're you're going to lose their attention. Well, um, something I learned from business, there's this concept of the bluff, which is the bottom line up front. So every headline in a memo or whatever it is, you tell it the most important thing and then you go into the details of the models or whatever it is in that. And so I, I want to echo what you're saying with the storytelling. To me, that is something that can differentiate a project. You do the same project as one other person and you can have a way more, way more interest, something that's way more compelling just because of how you frame it. So for example, I talked to someone a while ago I don't know if he's comfortable with me sharing his name, so I won't, I won't add it, but he did a cool project. It was just the Titanic data set, right? But he framed it <laughs> yeah. in, the, in the sense that he was a travel agent, right? And that makes it like a stupid data that everyone uses, but it makes it so that, hey, there's different meaning to this data now, right? Like, like, Absolutely. You, you know, that, that's something that's like, well, just looking at it from a different angle, taking a different stance, telling a different story with the same data, is something that can take a very basic project and make it into something that's extremely compelling for either employers or your own business or your own life. And th it's a lot easier than running all the more fancy algorithms, whatever it is, is just, hey, let's take this different perspective. So I cannot- I want to comment on important. that. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. My project is using a superstore data set. It's essentially the Titanic data set, except it's the Titanic data set for business. And so like, this is what everybody uses th their Tableau dashboards on. And because it is one of the cleanest data sets on this earth, um, that it's just kind of like, cool, let me create a project where I could tell a story where I'm optimizing for the story versus like how to do something crazy. I think another project that was landed really well that required a lot of more technology was we scraped LinkedIn. And in order to scrape LinkedIn, you have to make sure to do a lot of stuff because we got so many bots banned and IP banned. Uh, trust us. Like um, they don't want you to do this stuff. So we had to create ways in order to bypass this in order to get that information. So it's funny because I talked to like through Clubhouse, I met the director of engineering at um, Clubhouse and I told him about this project and he just laughed. Um, I was like, you yeah, I need API access. <laughs> I scraped Glassdoor, which is a lot easier. So maybe next time I have a yeah, whole project I, where I do that on YouTube. So, oh, sick. Yeah. You're gonna have to send that to me. But anyways, oh, yeah. uh, we, we were able to scrape all of these because the reason why we scrape LinkedIn particularly, because we wanted to optimize our keywords on our LinkedIn pages for those particular jobs, especially with a skill section, because, um, so we ended up like creating this whole scraper downloading all run um run like hey what are the most common words you know we use natural language processing or whatever just take out the buzzwords like of the blah 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 and just see which words came up most often and we were able to cut that out by different job titles and all of these things and that was a really fun project where you could we can showcase like hey we pulled all of this one we scraped it then we put it into mongodb uh cleaned it up and then and then put that MongoDB, put it into a um, into a relational database, and then put it out into a data visualization like Tableau, and then and then explained we always did our bluff as you said earlier like hey these are the keywords that you should have in your resume for a data analyst in LA, and so like that was the biggest key takeaway we started with that it was like hey this is how we got the data and how we move forward with it but this is the actionable insight now. So then that way, like, hey, if you want to replicate this, it's on GitHub. Here's everything that you need. As long um, as you're not and... applying to LinkedIn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, no, we, maybe we even if clear. you are, you know, who knows? They might appreciate No, they, that, they're probably, exact. I think they would. Um, like when I applied to PlayStation, like I showed them my gaming project. And um, when I interviewed, like they talked about gaming. And I was like, okay, cool. I, I know this stuff. I le legit have my esports flag right here. So I help a team called uh, Team War. We won in 2020 the world championship for the amateur teams. So sick. Congrats. Um, 
Thank you. Thank you. And that was that was why it was a uh, Call of Duty. Call of Duty, sick. Yep, yep. And that's why it was fun when I when I joined PlayStation. PlayStation was the uh, console of choice for Call of Duty, but now they moved to PC. So I'm just like, oh, okay, I gotta work at Nvidia now. <laughs> oh, luckily, <laughs> yeah, I, I know I know some people <laughs> over at Nvidia, so. <laughs> i love playstation though but uh but yeah uh projects um it doesn't matter if that it depends on what type of job if you want a software engineering job then yeah you got to go and build something um if you're a data analyst you just have to analyze data and be able to showcase that information because that's the most important thing um besides etl and cleaning up stuff but like you know you have, at the end of the day you have to effectively communicate this data and that's why you know, for me coming into the boot camp, like I knew this stuff because I, I, I had read Cole's book. I had read, you know, lean analytics where they talk about like minimal viable products and stuff of that nature. This is also have lean startup is a it's a lean startup kind of book. Oh, I, I want to read um, that actually. I'm going to put that on my list right now. Yeah, dude. I mean, just look, if you're into audio, just audio book it. Um, and then as far as like data visualization goes, this is the best book. It's a bis- big book of dashboards where they legit just have like dashboards here. Huh. And they explain how they built it and why they do certain things. So I legit just copy these uh, thought leaders and why reinvent the wheel when somebody has already spent their entire life to write this book and help you. And so that's kind of my philosophy with reading is like, so, Stephen Covey wrote the seven habits of a highly effective people and he dedicated his life to that book and the, all the conferences that followed after that. And, you know, if I, if you just read it, you can gain so much from it. Like there's all of these hidden gems hidden in books and people are too, like, I, I hated reading books in college because it's like, it was just forced down my throat, read five chapters tonight, read another fucking 10. And um, yeah. And it made me hate reading. <laughs> no, it's so valuable. I, actually, I, something I'd like to add on that is I before yeah. grad school the first time, I took a speed reading course and it's free Ooh. online. It's called readspeeder.com. I recommend it to everyone, but it completely changed reading for me. So I went on a tear and I, you know, I went from reading maybe 200 words a minute, which is slow to around 800, <laughs> 900 words a minute, right? 200 and, is my reading speed. <laughs> no, no, I mean, I mean that, that's what I was reading before I, before I did that. And like, I didn't realize, so that's why I actually, I prefer reading paper books, paperback, because I read so much faster than I can listen and process it. But Absolutely. I, I stress it so much is that, you know, if you can figure out a way to enjoy reading the amount of information that's going to be there, the amount of information that you can consume just about life or data or whatever you want to understand. Just as you said, people condense all of their knowledge into their book. Like that's their manifesto. That's their life's work. You can get an understanding of someone's entire life's work in like four hours. If you read it, if you read pretty quick, right. Isn't that crazy? Um, One of my friends, Christina Stathopoulos, who uh, who's like a, a rock star in terms of like data and speaking and doing those types of things she does this book a week challenge where, you know, that's like her big thing, like my 66 days of data challenge. And, uh, you know, again, she's a rock star, not just because of that, but I mean, it's a huge contributing factor. So, you know, that, that's like one of those levers you pull with me and I'm like, dude, you should see my, my bookshelf. I way, I I love the like self-help books. That's my, my niche. I, and biographies. I love understanding those, but, Oh my God. uh, to move on to something that you can't learn in books, I would love to understand your experience growing on Clubhouse and pursuing a new social platform and how that has leveraged into a lot of really cool opportunities for your career and how other people maybe in the future can also, you know, either leverage that platform or new platforms that come out. Because that's something that, you know, I, with, without a shadow of a doubt, you're one of the largest influencers on that platform. If we're looking at the the pure numbers and you know, that's fascinating to me. I mean, I'm by no stretch of the imagination, one of the largest influencers on YouTube, right? Like the, the, to get to that pinnacle in such a short time, I'm always fascinated with those stories and especially not just what the listeners can, can learn, but what, what I can learn from the story as well. (laughs) Oh my God. Let me just tell you. So this seriously has a lot of passion driven behind it. And 
um, in January, I, I, I was coming off this, you know, I, I don't know, through the, through the December, like, it was kind of depressing. Uh, it was COVID cases were high, you know, family members were getting sick. And, you know, I was getting kind of sick, and I was just like, mentally blocked. And so December to January came around, I decided to, you know, create a vision board. And really just write down what do I want to get out of 2021, right? I have all the time in the world. I might not ever get this time back. I get to be here with my family. And so we sat down one day and we, we created our vision board. And one of the things I wrote down on there is like, cool, like I'm making more money than I've ever could do with it um, being in tech. I'm like, what am I going to do with this now? Like, what, what, what do I really want? Um, because I have a stand-up desk, I have a professional microphone, like these things don't and they make me happy. So um, one of the things I've looked back on is like this past year, I spoke at 12 different conferences. I had one a month, sometimes twice a month. And that brought me so much joy. So on my vision board, I put, um, I want to be the Gary Vaynerchuk of something. I want to be the Tony Robbins of something. I want to speak in front of thousands of people. And, um, you know, I'm speaking at colleges now, you know, I, I did DataCon LA and that I had like, maybe like 150 people watch me. I talked about how to get into business intelligence. And so in January, like I was writing this stuff out around, like I said, around the 17th, I finished it. And I had this picture of Gary Vaynerchuk in front of like a, a bunch of people. And I was like, that's what I want. I want to be an influencer. I want to be, I want to be a thought leader. And I was like, I have so much joy into that. So <laughs> you can imagine um, in J uh, January 23rd, my friend said, dude, I think you'd really like this app called Clubhouse. And I was like, nah, that sounds dumb. Like, why would somebody just talk on an app? And immediately the first day I jump on, a bunch of my friends from college were there. I just started talking with them. And we had a closed room. We were talking I'm like, oh, this is so cool. And, you know, this is just like a, you know, a Microsoft Teams meeting with all of us and it's easy to come in and stuff. And after I left that, I started looking at the hallway or, you know, essentially the homepage of Clubhouse. And I saw these rooms about like, um, like how to get into investing, um, music people in LA. And also the last one I saw, it was like, it was a tech recruiting room. And I was just like, whoa, this is crazy. So day one, day early early days i met this guy named jared and he created this room where he had facebook amazon apple netflix google all in one place and i was like holy shit these people are here these people are here on clubhouse talking about how to get into these places like i had worked so hard to get into playstation and nike but these people are here just saying hey i'm at instagram you know hit me up i was like oh my god so i went into that room and I like I got I threw up my profile picture, said like, hey, I'm an analyst at Nike or uh, at PlayStation. And I just started getting involved in the tech community. Um, and with that being said, you know, one thing led to another. I was starting to drop gems of like, hey, this is what I did in my boot camp. This is how I pivoted from a photographer to um, an analyst. And now I'm I'm sold that your network is your your net worth is your network. And so I saw this as like a major net, networking platform. So I started jumping onto Jared's stages all the time. And I was like, dude, I can run my own rooms. You know, I'm doing this stuff all the time already. So I opened up my first room and um, I took a lot of the network that Jared had put out there in his recruiting rooms. And I was like, cool, let, let's do a room about like how to, how to master your LinkedIn and how to utilize LinkedIn to find a job. I started doing that like every week um, shoot, if not every day, I was doing something new every day. And that's where I met you. Um, and we ran, um, we ran how to get, how to negotiate, how to negotiate salaries, how to do these things. And over time, I just kept doing it. I was putting in the hours, um, a lot of hours. And I just started growing my network. Next thing I know, I meet the director of LinkedIn. He comes into my room. He brings the, he brings the head of data science in there. I, I just, all these LinkedIn people are coming in and start adding stuff to this and i just realized like this app is is doing it and i would say a month in i had a room of 2500 people and i was talking about i was talking about linkedin and to me that was crazy like i actualized my dream that i wrote down speaking in front of thousands of people and i did that on clubhouse and now today I have 23,000 followers and whenever I open up a room, it'll be populated with 
at least 50 people. Um, and, and I could get that going. And I, I've built this thought leadership that I never thought I would ever get anywhere else. And it's already opened so many doors for me. Like I, I feel completely secure that I can, if I wanted to work at Google, I could, if I wanted to work at Facebook, I could, um, you know, I, those people are just there to like, they, they want me to work with them. Right. They're like, Christian, whenever you want to work here, just let me know. We'll get you that referral link. You're going to have an outstanding referral. And, you know, we want people like you, you know, cause there are like, how am I different from other analysts is that like, I'm hardcore extroverted and I'm an analyst second. I'm a business entrepreneur first. And I just got into data because like, I, I just liked it. Like I was pretty good at it, I think. And so um, that's something that's kind of rare in the, in the space to be able to openly talk about data and explain it to people. So, so yeah, pretty much Clubhouse opened up the networking stuff. I actualized my dreams from it. And that's why I'm so bullish on audio. And now, like, honestly, I was getting prepared to set up my own podcast. And then Clubhouse came out. And I was just like, all right, you know, let me just do let me just do Clubhouse for now. Because it's been such a big, like, I, like, I don't know, I have like 4,000, I have 1,000 followers on Twitter. And I just opened up Twitter to be for Clubhouse. And now I'm starting to really, like, see the power of, of everything. So yeah, with Clubhouse, there's so much opportunity there. Like there's so many rooms that, you know, you could be a part of to help with UX, UI, data science. I also run the data science and analytics club. Um, and so with it, within that, you know, we talk about like, what is data science? What is data analytics? Like what kind of tools you need to know? And so um, that is kind of like the biggest thing with Clubhouse for me. So definitely, uh, man, I could talk about Clubhouse all day. Let me know if you have any other questions on it. No, well, there's two things that I really want to like expand on and and that I really liked. I, so I think, you know, one thing you said is that, you know, you're an entrepreneur, you're extroverted, you're these things and also a data analyst. I think that everyone should have some introspection. You don't have to be extroverted to have career success yeah. in this field, but that's a feature that you can leverage very, like you personally have leveraged very effectively on the platforms that you're a part of, right? Like being introverted on Clubhouse isn't gonna work that well. But you can very well be introverted and have an incredible blog where you go into great depth that doesn't work those same extroversion muscles, right? Like match your personality, your characteristics, who you are, and find the channel that works best for you and absolutely wear it out. And I mean, obviously you, you haven't worn it out yet in the clubhouse front. <laughs> you're, still, you're still in the process of really giving it a beating. And and that's like, a, I think that's an awesome thing is that you've done the homework, you found something that can help you actualized what you had created a vision for. Again, I want to stress this with your background or, or your experiences is you've had very clear outcomes and you've set those very clear outcomes for, for yourself. You know, you want to be the, you wanted to create the perfect data analyst resume and match it to your skill set. done. You wanted to be the Gary V of some field, perhaps data analytics you're well on your way to doing that. And you've, because you had that clear vision, it was very easy for you to figure out what the steps were in between to get to that point. And you also find serendipity in those things is that if you're kind of targeted at a certain outcome, a lot of the times it opens your mind to see opportunities that, that you didn't previously see because you weren't looking for them. I think I was talking to someone, one of my friends about like the law of attraction and those types of things. And like from a quantitative perspective, I don't really believe that like if you just <laughs> want something enough, you can get there. But if you start to train yourself to see the opportunities to get to your end goal and everything, those things become a lot more possible, a lot more clear. And so the idea is, yeah, maybe like, like the whole idea of the law of attraction is, is kind of BS. But the idea that you know what you want and you can start to visualize and conceptualize all the things that, that can get you there if you have a clear understanding of it is a very, very real phenomenon. Yeah. I mean, the way that I think about stuff, like I think everything's in my mind started to click back in high school when um, I was learning how to play ukulele. And I was like, there was this course in high school called music theory where you know, I would play ukulele. I didn't know any of the chords I was playing. I just knew like, oh, this is C, this is, I, I, I didn't even know the letters. I was just like, this is the shape. Once I learned music theory, which kind of said like, hey, each note, there's 12 notes. There's only 12 notes in a key. And those 12 notes can create 
chords and those chords could create chord progressions those chord progressions create songs songs create albums albums sell boom like once i realized that music could be broken down into smaller steps that can be um easily under understood and i could start seeing the patterns with that that was in my mind where like i knew i was i was primed to be a data analyst or something along those lines where i'm breaking down these like things that used to be very abstract and make it very um not abstract and plain if, if anything like now when i listen to music i could be like yeah that, i know that chord progression i could pick up a guitar and play it right away because i know what i've played those things oh another background um before i was a photographer i was a touring musician uh, i played guitar and sang <laughs> and so Character um, depth, i man. think <laughs> i was gonna say like maybe i should start the story off i used to busk for money <laughs> and then i became a photographer and then I learned how to, like, busking was first. I would go on the streets in Second Street in, in Long Beach and go in front of a van store. They had this, like, this door that was kind of like this. And, like, I would, I, would, I would create this little acoustics where I would go here and then I would be able to, to play inside of this, like, this is, the, this is the doors. And so I put myself I put, essentially where my face is. And I would be able to project out and like, I'll get the biggest sound on the street. Um, and so, yeah, that's where I started. But anyways, um, going back to, um, going back to the fact of um, entrepreneurship and stuff like you're, you're absolutely right. You should always go back to like wherever you feel more comfortable in. Like if you're introverted, write the heck out of medium post LinkedIn. And for me, speaking is like my favorite thing to do. Sometimes my parents are just like, Ugh. <laughs> but like it, it, it is what it is. But yeah. I mean, that's incredible. I, I think that, you know, it's something that you embody quite a bit and your past experience of shape. This is this kind of hustle mentality where like you're going to get it done. You, you know, you're, you're very, again, we've stressed on this a lot, but you, you can articulate to yourself what you want. And it's not about, oh, this is overwhelming. It's like, well, how do I get there? And I think that's something everyone can, can take away from or, or start to learn. And it's learned. It's not something you're born with is to develop this more of a hustle mindset around data science, around data analytics, around getting a job is that I'm going to figure out what I want. This is how we're going to break it down. So we're going to chop it up. I mean, getting a data science job, you know, making a hundred and whatever thousand dollars a year, it's a large undertaking. It's huge. It's, it's a lot of work. Huge. You know, you're talking about a, a ton of Years. projects that you have to do. Yeah. yeah. And you're not going to get it done unless you just chunk it down. It's like, well, I should probably learn how to write, not, not even learn Python. It's like, well, I should probably learn what a variable is in Python and then what a loop is and then what uh, like a function is and then maybe what a class is and then maybe start picking up some statistics and all these things. Mm -hmm. But um, like their progression, they can be broken down in isolation, like, writing hello world is not very difficult and it's a first step, <laughs> right? And it's like, well, there's just a bunch of really small steps. It's not just one giant impossible leap that a lot of people conceive it to be. Um, yeah, so one thing I wanna comment before we go to the next question, like in my mind, I remember where I was going last time. In my mind, I know it. I can do whatever I want. Like I can, if I wanna become a millionaire, I can become a millionaire. Like something broke in my brain where like, I had this limiting factor, like, oh, I can't do this. I can't do that. I mean, once, once again, when I learned music theory, that broke the thing of like, okay, abstract things can be taught. Then I was like, what else can I, what else is abstract? I looked at like fitness and I was like, okay, let me go read a book on how fitness works and how body fat works. Boom. I lost 75 pounds and you know, I was the fittest in my life. And now I have a home gym where I go work out at and I know how to utilize macros and this, this, this data science part of eating. And now that I know just like with data, like any, anything I could want to do, I can do it. That's why I like clubhouse because um, I'm filled with rooms of other people that have the same mindset, especially in the marketing rooms. Like these people are abundance mind thinkers. Like you can do whatever you want. Just where do you want to put your effort into? And that's going to be the biggest thing. And how do you utilize your network to be able to help you learn and get you connected with those certain people? You have to be one, you have to be a connector, but you also have to be a person that is easily connecting to other people as well. So I just want to put that out there. Like, I think limiting mindset is one of the biggest deterrents. Like people are like, oh, I can't do this. I can't make hundred K a year. I'm like, heck yeah, you can. I was making 30 K a year in, I don't know, 
2018, 2019. And so like after that, like now I make over, you know, 200. And it's just like, it's, it's just wild. I'm in, I'm the same person. I just have a whole lot of books downloaded into my brain and a boot camp. But other than that, like it's a, it's a mindset. And that's why I really like reading personal development books too, because you know, it's not just for the data science people. It's anybody that wants to become something great in their life, if that's something that they want. Other people focus on family. For me, it was like, cool, how do I get my career and money? Now that I have that, it's just like, okay, cool. Do I want to get more money or do I want to, do I want to have impact? And th these are the type of things that I'm thinking about right now. It's like, cool, what's next? So yeah. definitely out there to say, like, you could do whatever you want. So your listeners, you can do whatever you put your mind to. Just do it. <laughs> I love that. Well, and, you know, something something that I do want to like touch on, I think this is a really short thing, but you've done this in a pretty short amount of time. We're talking essentially like two years or a little more than two years, right? To go from this like pers like traditional zero data, data analytics knowledge to, to these types of roles. And while that seems like actually a pretty long time, if you really think about it, um, if you're if you're in the moment living through it, Right. I'm sure it felt like, wow, I've been oh, on this God. journey forever. But, you know, looking back, that seems like a, you know, in retrospect, now that we're talking about it, it seems like really quick, like, wow, he, he did so much in this short period of time. And the way we perceive time, it's, it's like pretty warped. And when you're <laughs> learning data science, when you're learning data analytics, when you're in this process, everything is going to feel like it's going so slow. Right. Yes. And then you look back and you're like, wow, I did that in a year, a year and a half. Oh, my God, it came so far. Um, I think it's really important to just think of the timeframes and say, hey, like, I'm not going to evaluate myself on a week to week basis, maybe on a month to month basis, maybe on a six month basis. But if I'm looking at my success over the course of a year or of two years, that's where I'm going to see the most change. And that's going to be encouraging for me, not discouraging looking at like, oh, you know, I don't like I do this all the time. I'm like, wow, I didn't do anything this week. Right. Like my the video I made wasn't, you know, it, it wasn't a hit, whatever it might be, or like the work I did, I didn't finish this project. Like if I zoom out, it's like, wow, like the last three months, holy crap, I've, I've had three of some, like the best videos I've ever had or or whatever it is, it's, it's, it's all in our perspective. And I think that's so much a part of those limiting beliefs you're talking about is like almost all of this stuff seems impossible if we're talking about you only have a week to do it because it essentially is. But hopefully yeah. we have our whole lives to do it. So uh, I do, I do want to... Um, Actually, that is all the questions I had that, that at the end of every interview, I leave the floor open to you to talk about essentially anything you care about, anything that, that you would like to stress, advice, or whatever that might be. Um, so the floor is yours. You got maybe about five minutes because I know we can sure. just keep going. For... <laughs> uh, yeah, for sure, Ben. Um, I was going to say, um, if you are thinking about joining Clubhouse, I know there's a lot of different people creating their own audio drop-in apps. Um, you know, by the time you're listening to this, I would recommend jump on there. Um, and if you want, if you want to get into tech and you want to be in those rooms, I would definitely say, follow me at Christian B life. We'll make sure to get it in the notes and stuff. But if you follow me, like I'm always in these tech recruiting rooms. And, you know, if you want to talk to somebody at Facebook, that's at software engineering, I got a guy. Um, I have a UX guy at Netflix, also a software engineer at Netflix. Um, I'm also very connected with data analysts um, and data scientists on Clubhouse. So, you know, that's a really cool place to really just listen to the these people. Like before Clubhouse, I didn't know any other data analysts. Like if I did, like I was, to be completely honest, I always felt like, like I knew more than them. And I didn't like that. I don't like being the smartest person in the room. So if you want to feel like, you know, you want to hear some really educated people talk, it's Clubhouse is one of the coolest places to just get that brain meld and you're just like, Oh my God, like I'm asking for tips. I'm like, Hey, how do I, how do I scale out AB tests? And how do I, and then they're like, yeah, read this book. This is the, this is the thing to have, like, right. That's just the unlock. Um, and things happen so fast on clubhouse and it's fun. Besides that, besides getting into tech, there's all these different fun things that you can do in there. But, um, but yeah, I'll, I just wanted to reiterate. And the last part is um, I wanted to re kind of go back to what you were saying earlier. Like, about like, hey, how do you measure success, right? Like you, you, you know, everything feels so slow when you're learning data science. Like, you know, you go in there like, what did I really learn this week? What did I really accomplish? And that's why I like data analytics because data analytics is like, as an analogy, it's kind of like a scale, 
like when you jump on a scale for when you're checking your weight and stuff where if you track it every day you know you could kind of see you you know am i losing weight am i gaining weight depending on what your goals are right and that's how i like data analytics i'm always thinking like for me like i know every hour that i put into clubhouse is going towards thought leadership and it's going towards maybe even monetization like the craziest thing is like the first two weeks of clubhouse i made two thousand dollars when monetization came out and so that's that's crazy. You know, people really love the content I put out there and that's not even all the monetization features that are there to begin with. And so with that being said, I'm just like, um, be intentional, have clarity on what your end goal is and really just find those people that are doing the things that you want to do now and, you know, talk with them. I'm sure they'd be very open to like mentoring you because for me, that's, that's, that's what I love about clubhouse is that I get to mentor thousands of people um and help thousands of people with their linkedins and you know i love getting those messages back saying hey christian thank you so much for your linkedin class i've never got hit up by recruiters so much and you know i did it for free and i did it for the community and i think that's why i grew so fast because a lot of people are selling courses and stuff which i think is totally fine i don't have nothing against salespeople, but for me i was i was in it for a different game i was in it for social equity and networking and so this was the best way for me to go about it, um, putting my time in there. So, um, Ken, thank you so much for having me. And oh my gosh, yes, we we got to get these books out there for everybody. And oh yeah, I cannot wait to to um, get this out there. So thank you so much for having me. Awesome, thank you so much for coming on.